I want to start today with a quote from Rust Cole, the character in the TV series True Detective. The script was actually written by someone who's strongly influenced by nihilist philosophy and also, I think, somewhat uh, by Buddhist philosophy. It's hard to find something in a man who rejects people as much as you do. You know that? I never told you how to live your life, Marty. No, no, no. You just sat in judgment. Look, as sentient meat, however illusory our identities are, we craft those identities by making value judgments. Everybody judges all the time. This is a quote here going like this. Uh, as sentient meat, however illusory our identities are, we craft those identities by making value judgments. So this quote brings together morality as a form of making judgments and the shaping of identity. And uh, that's the topic of today. One of the phrases that is used all over the place nowadays is the notion of our values. And I think the use of that phrase speaks very much to the crafting of identity through moral language. Just a few examples here. The last presidential contest between Biden and Trump. Biden announces his candidacy by saying he represents the core values of this nation. Uh, similarly, Trump in election campaigns asks the people to support candidates who stand for our values. So our values again. Now, in the war situation in Ukraine, uh, both sides argue also on the basis of our values and thereby shape identity. In the West, the Russian attack is often understood as um, attack against our Western values. On the other hand, Russia also sees itself as fighting for its own values, traditional values. Similarly, just a few years ago, uh, here in Asia, there was a big debate about Asian values in the context of something like a clash of civilizations arising. There was this idea that uh, there is a specific set of Asian values that constitutes a specific Asian identity. And that was used in a political context. And now, similarly, we have here in China, the campaign's been going on for quite a while, uh, the so-called core socialist values, which thereby shape the identity of contemporary China. And of course, this reference to our values is now ubiquitous. Well, you find it, for instance, uh, also in the academic context, like every university now has value statements, mission st statements, no matter if it's Harvard University or if it's the University of Macau, which actually has some traditional Confucian values, Ren Yi, Li, Zhe, and Xin, in its logo. And then, of course, corporations, all the big corporations now uh, promote their core values, no matter which corporation here we look, can look at Apple or Microsoft. Now, to analyze this a little bit further, I want to first look at the ambiguity of the notion of value. In many languages, in English, also in German, Wert, or in Chinese, Jia mm -hmm. value has two different but related meanings. Uh, originally, the term means something like having strength, having goodness, but then the two concrete meanings of it are in all these languages. First, in an ethical sense, something has moral worth, or in an economic sense, in a financial sense, right? Something has monetary worth, has financial worth. Now, talking about the moral usage of the term, about moral value, in the context of the still dominating views of morality, which I discussed in another video, the notion of value is usually used in three different specific senses, right? It can be morality can be supposed to be the quality of a person. In Greek philosophy, have this also in Chinese philosophy. So in this sense, morality would be a characteristics of a person and moral value would be the value of a person. Or you can ascribe it to an act, right? Whatever you do. And this is still the case in a lot of Anglo-American philosophy based on utilitarianism, for instance, right? So an action is supposed to be morally good, and because of this, it has moral value. Or, and this is more the German tradition coming from uh, Immanuel Kant, but now still also still very influential in, in critical theory, uh, 
the moral goodness and moral value lies in the quality of a principle that then maybe you act upon. So today's ethics are still dominated by these approaches, and so is the notion of moral value. However, the point I want to make here, as in a previous video, is actually morality and moral value does not lie in any of these three things, but is actually a type of communication. And the value is something that is constructed in communication. So, Moral value is something that is produced by a specific way of looking at the world, by interpreting the world. It's produced through the framing of something, through a certain use of language, of thinking. Uh, and this idea can be found very explicitly already in Nietzsche. Uh, here, one quote from the Nachlass, the posthumous fragments, where he says, My main proposition, there are no moral phenomena, only a moral interpretation of these phenomena. And this interpretation itself is of extra-moral origin. So, according to this view that I share, morality is something like a historically contingent social contract, something that is developed in specific historical contexts and over time. And that's what Nietzsche traced in the genealogy of morals. Again, connecting this with monetary value, with economic value, we can also see the a history of the emergence of monetary value, right? In the past, there were only a few things that would have value, but then in the course of history, more and more things were commodified, whatever, land, and then eventually such things as education or healthcare uh, in modernity, that then also became of a certain economic value. So, Nietzsche, the point that Nietzsche is making is similar basically to a history of economic value, looking at the construction of value in a historical context, which also means there was a time, which is also what Nietzsche is saying, before the moral connotation of the notion of value. There was a time when the word value did not yet mean moral value or economic value, it just meant something like goodness or strength. And you can find a similar thing already in Taoism. In the Lao Tzu, for instance, there is this saying in chapter 18, Da Dao Fei, Yo Ren Yi. When the great Tao was dispensed with, there was humanity and righteousness. So again, moral language being a um, historically contingent construct. So, if moral value is similar to economic value, something that is constructed in society, then maybe we can um, trace the analogy a little bit further, right? So, economic value is created in society by, by trading. It is directly connected to a market of goods. And similarly, we can speak of moralizing as a type of value communication that functions on what we could maybe call the market of reputation. And in this sense, uh, social theorist Niklas Luhmann defines morality as the conditions on the market of social esteem. So, if morality can be defined as the conditions on the market of social esteem, then, importantly, morality is something very different from what it is supposed to be, for instance, by Plato. Uh, in the dialogue Eudifro, the central problem is is something good because it's what the gods love, or do the gods love something because it is morally good? And these are basically two different forms of looking at morality. In the first case, the source of morality is transcendent. The gods, which transcend our empirical reality, somehow make this distinction between good and bad, so it is of a divine origin. Uh, in the second sense, the gods approve of something because it is good. The origin is not transcendent, but transcendental. It is based in some form of basic, let's say, logic, which makes something inherently good or bad. So, the idea that morality is a social construct, which 
develops throughout history contradicts both these assumptions in Plato's Euthyphro. If it is something that is just created in language, uh, then we can say uh, something is morally good because we say it pleases the gods, even though the gods don't exist. So what this is to say is simply morality is not outside, neither transcendent nor transcendental of society, but it is inside, it is inherently social. Now, if this is the case, then I think we can look at moral values similarly to how, for instance, Marx looked at economic value, namely in relation to the modes of production. Right? Morality is somehow produced just like economic value is produced, but what value specifically is, how it is created, has something to do with a specific mode of production. So, going back to the initial quote from True Detectives, however illusory our identities are, we craft those identities by making value judgments. There are different modes of crafting. And again, combining identity and value construction, we can say that the modes of identity production correspond to the modes of moral value production. In general, I think we can distinguish between three kinds of identity construction, three different identity technologies. In traditional societies, identity was produced through role orientation, right? For instance, roles in the family and so forth. This went along with a morality and moral values connected with these roles. So generally this can be called a morality of honor, a morality of face, right? So uh, whatever, women and men have different codes of honor that are related to their specific social roles. Then in modern society this changes and we have a shift towards um, the identity technology of authenticity. So now identity is no longer oriented to social roles and the conformity with them, but everyone's supposed to somehow find or create their inner self. And this goes along with the shift in the construction of moral values. Uh, they become more and more oriented towards an ethics of independence. Independence is a very new notion that now we take for granted. But actually there is a shift towards independence only takes place in the 17th century or so. Independence becomes a moral value both for individuals as well as a moral value informing very much politi politics and revolutions and wars who are no, no longer primarily fought in the name of defending honor, but in the name of achieving or defending independence. Now, um, if we look at today's society, uh, arguably we are witnessing a shift from authenticity to profilicity, to profile-oriented identity. And again, I think uh, we also witness a shift in the mode of production of morality. Identity is now increasingly achieved by curating a profile and then successfully presenting it, and the success lies in the validation of the profile by a general peer, by a certain public. This again shows now the importance or the orientation towards, again, the market of social esteem. And the identity curation is very much concerned with the idea of presentability. And I think what we are seeing right now is an emerging creation of morality with an orientation towards the value of presentability. Mm -hmm. I want to discuss this a little further and again have another quote here by the German-Korean thinker Byung-Chul Han from his book The Disappearance of Rituals. Han writes there, Neoliberalism often makes use of morality for its own ends. Moral values are consumed as marks of distinction. 
they are credited to the ego account, appreciating the value of the self. What we see here is the emergence of what I'd like to call a moral economy. Uh, not in the sense of how this term has been used regularly with reference to an economy that is somehow morally good, but instead looking at moral economy in the sense of the commodification of moral language to increase identity value or to increase a profile value. So moral economy is an economy that commodifies morality and uses it to create also some form of economical value. And again, this is directly tied to presentability of an individual or an organization. In other words, in order to be presentable, you need to create moral value of the profile that you present. A profile, be it of an individual or of a collective or co corporation or something like that, is not really presentable if it lacks moral value. Right? So the value of profile creation is much enhanced by the successful communication of moral values. I want to give one concrete example of this, and this is something I just saw in the news uh, the other day. It's about Wimbledon, the famous tennis tournament, and th there was an announcement by the organizers that Russian and Belarusian players were banned from participation this year. And this was communicated in a rather short statement, and I want to read from this statement. Uh, they say, we share in the universal condemnation of Russia's illegal actions. Given the profile of the championships, it is our responsibility to limit Russia's global influence. Ian Hewitt, chairman of the All England Club, commented, given the high profile environment of the championships, we do not believe it's viable to proceed on any other basis. So three things about this. First of all, they refer here to a universal condemnation, which is actually factually problematic because Russia is not universally condemned. There are many regions and countries in the world uh, like China, India, Mexico, Brazil, uh, which had, or African countries, which um, didn't really condemn Russia. But of course, regarding the social peer within which Wimbledon operates, the condemnation is perceived as universal. So this is clearly addressed to a specific general peer. Now, obviously, uh, secondly, the reference to profile is not simply about preventing Russia from an opportunity to create its profile, but in the background, which I think is obvious, uh, is that this is mainly about curating the moral profile of the Wimbledon tournament, which directly translates into the moral value of the Wimbledon brand. So what this is, is very obvious, very explicit, an observation of the market of social esteem. Right? So this is the market of socialist team for Wimbledon more or less universally condemns Russia. So the observation of the market of socialist team necessitates this statement in order to maintain the presentability of the Wimbledon tournament. If they would admit Russian competitors, that would seriously harm the presentability of the tournament. So again, this shows it's not because the questionable morality of the players, it's not that they are bad persons, nor is it even that they have done anything bad. Most of them have, I guess, not much to do with the war. 
Uh, and it's also not about any specific moral principle that the participation of these players would violate. The major point, which is very explicitly addressed, is that it would somehow make the tournament morally less presentable. The profile orientation of this statement becomes also very clear in the final sentence of the short statement. They say, if circumstances change materially between now and June, when the tournament is actually held, we will consider and respond accordingly. So it's again exactly like observing the financial markets. They say, okay, the markets of morality are very volatile. And of course, there is a chance that the presentability will change until June. The basis of their exclusion of the Russian players is not a certain moral principle, but actually that the conditions on the market of social approval do not allow for their participation. Actually, something similar happened with Will Smith. Uh, because right after the slapping, the organizers were very unsure what to do. It took them several days to officially condemn Will Smith, and they actually apologized for this lag in time. But of course, they had to wait, because right after the act, the conditions on the market of social approval or in the market of social esteem hadn't settled yet. You have to wait for the social feedback loops until you can see what has certain moral value and what not. So it wasn't really possible to immediately react to Will Smith's actions. Uh, you first have to engage in the second order observation of the conditions on the market of social esteem. Uh, let me conclude so, uh, with a few statements. So first, I think it's clear Moral value begets economic value. It raises or lowers the profile value of individuals or collectives. In this sense, everyone nowadays has to practice a certain moral economy of the self. Right? For instance, a public moral mishap of a person, like a morally problematic statement on social media, for instance, can destroy a person's employability and thereby destroy their personal economic value. Similarly, a wrong statement by a corporation can destroy the brand. So again, this shows that moral communication is not something transcendent or transcendental. It's not an external corrective of society, but it's an internal mode of communication that follows a certain mode of production of identity value, the crafting identity in communication. And it is oriented to the presentability of profile identity. It's oriented to a market that has to be continuously observed.